now let us begin our session formally. Now uh, you can, will now follow more or less quickly in the scheme of things which we have. So, what I will do is I will quickly go through this and since I need some uh, soothing time for my throat, maybe every 15, 20 minutes I will have a, a discussion session as required. First thing is, this is for us and also for our students, go through our uh, exercises sheet and at the back of the title page, you will find a list of textbooks and references. So, uh, these are the five books which give a general broad perspective. Each one is unique and has its own style of presentation. For example, the third one, Sears and Salinger, which is even currently available, and uh, Zimansky, fourth edition of 1957. There are later on later editions, but in particular, I would uh, recommend this edition. These are the two books which are written by professors of physics. However, their uh, treatment of thermodynamics, basic thermodynamics is it's really good and that is why we always ask our students to refer to these books as uh, background material. The book by Sears and Salinger is the standard textbook for uh, maybe our, our own physics students here. So, and it is commonly available in India, whereas Zimansky's fourth edition would essentially be available in the libraries, may not be available now. Later on, the, there are newer editions of Zimansky, now there is a co-author, I do not think Professor Zimansky uh, is there in the now, Zimansky and Dickman, but they have become so physics oriented that uh, they cannot be really appreciated by non-physics engineers. Whereas the other three books, 1, 3 and 4, 1, 2 and 4 by Achyutan, Moran and Shapiro and uh, Sontag, Borgnak, Van Weyland. The Sontag and uh, book that um, authors and their list order keeps on changing. So, maybe um, there is a newer edition with a different, these are engineering thermodynamics books, essentially written with the mechanical engineers uh, as the target group. And in particular, I would recommend Moran and Shapiro and Achyutan are the books which would be more or less uh, exposing the reader to thermodynamics in our scheme of things. And at some places in the exercises, you will notice that I have uh, recommended as part of the exercises, some exercises from Moran and Shapiro, Achyutan, even Sears and Salinger and Sontag, at least in the early part where it is essentially basic physics of thermodynamics rather than applications. Now, the evaluation scheme is not something for us to uh, really worry about because many of you do not have any control over it, but I will just say that because thermodynamics is a subject which starts from basic physics and goes into application. Uh, if possible, the best evaluation scheme for thermodynamics would be more or less a continuous evaluation scheme. Now, continuous evaluation scheme cannot be parallel evaluation scheme with teaching. So, uh, I personally uh, like the scheme which of course, in a uh, fully autonomous place like IIT Bombay, I can implement it is every second week you will have a quiz. So, in a 12 to 14 week semester, you end up having 6 or 7 quizzes. And the quiz will be just my quiz as my students know here, it is just one sheet of paper A4 size with the question written here and student has space to write his name and roll number at the top. And the answer has to be written in this space as well as in this space. And it is a small quiz, uh, 
may be as short as 15 minutes, sometimes as long as 25 minutes. Okay. I do not think I have ever conducted a quiz, quiz more than 20 minutes, 10 to 15, 15 to 20 minutes is the normal thing. The advantage of such an evaluation scheme is not only the student learns what he has learnt or not learnt, and also the uh, teacher understand what are the difficult part for a student. And th this has to be no great thing, a simple small question which uh, relates to what has been taught in the last two weeks and just to find out whether the student has understood it or not. No great acrobatics is required in these cases. Now, when we start teaching thermodynamics, typically in the second year, first semester, I think that is the place thermodynamics finds itself. Sometimes in the first year, second semester, but that is very rarely, but sometimes in the second year, second semester. So, the question arises and the students are not yet clear or not completely clear about what is engineering, what is mechanical engineering and what is the place of thermodynamics in it. So, quickly what I explain to the student, since you are teacher, I will not spend much time. I explain to the students that, look, we are human beings, we want a comfortable life, good quality of life. So, whatever we do should be to sustain that good quality of life. And the job of any engineer is to provide that quality of life and for that the resources are only natural resources. So, nature at one end, humans at the other end. The engineer sits in between making use of the resources provided by nature to provide us uh, a good quality of life. Now, where does mechanical engineering come into picture? So, if we say nature at one end and humans at the other end and provide good life is the job of an engineer. If so, I propose that the, where does mechanical engineering come? Now, all of us are told that mechanical engineering is about machines. But again the scheme remains the same, we have nature at one end and we have humans at the other end. And mechanical engineers are also engineers, so they should do the job of providing good life to humans. But for us, the main scheme is machines. What type of machines? First or one of the main theme is use natural resources, <coughs> materials, stores of energy, to provide power, useful energy. This power sometimes can be directly used for good of humans. Of course, this power can often be used and is used for drive machines. And of course, not all machines provide power. There are machines which provide power specifically to drive machines. There are machines which produce machines, machines which produce many other goods which are in turn made use of for the welfare of humans. So, although machines are at the heart of these things, remember that machines which are looked at by mechanical engineers are of the type where natural resources are used to convert it into power. Power can be used for human consumption as well as to drive machines. Machines can also be used to produce machines and many other things which are used for the good of humans. I think once you give the students this idea of what mechanical engineering is typically about, in fact, if you look at the history of engineering, uh, mechanical engineering was the early branching of engineering. If you go back some 500, 600 years, 
or go to a linguist and he will tell you when was the first word, uh, when was the word engineering used for the first time. At that time there was no classification, but one uh, characteristic of humans is that humans feel well when they are secure. We are always interested in our security, security of us as persons, security of our family, security of our group, our tribe, our nation and all that. So, anything which we do, we first look at the security aspect, subconsciously at least. Okay. So, uh, any effort, any new scheme, the first implementation would be that of security. So, when engineering was first developed, catapults were developed to throw cannonballs at the enemy. Okay. So, was bows and arrows and so were sharp instruments like spears. Then later on people realized when many of the security concerns were apparently taken care of that engineering has other non-security applications also. So, the security applications were known as military applications and in military you have military officers and civil engineers, so civil people, civilians. So, engineering got classified into the military engineering and civil engineering. If you look at the civil was from the non-military point of view, so the civil engineers that civility comes from the word civilians in the military scheme of rankings. If you look at uh, the history of engineering in India, one of the oldest colleges which is now the IIT Roorkee was earlier University of Roorkee and if you go still back before it was formalized as University of Roorkee, it was some I think Thompson College of Military Engineering. Okay. So, old uh, Roorkee alumni call themselves Thompsonian, I do not think any one of them is around, but if you go through the history you will find. So, the first branching of uh, engineering was military and civil. So, all non-military applications were supposed to be taken care of by civil engineers. Then what happens as the applications grew, the civil engineers found that they had to handle power equipment, they had to produce machines, they have to also establish roads, bridges and houses. So, the structural part was kept by civil engineers and mechanical engineers specialized into the machinery part. But of course, there were common things for example, hydraulics flow of water. It is something on which mechanical engineers and civil engineers still have a common thing. And if I am not mistaken, there are a few institutes in India which have both engineering <coughs> departments of mechanical and civil, but they have a huge big excellent hydraulics lab which is shared by both the departments. AICT may not like it, but that is the ground reality. You know, uh, flow through channels whether closed or open is of interest both to mechanical engineers and civil engineers. Similarly, even on structures, when it comes to steel structures, whether you are a mechanical engineer or civil engineer, it does not really matter. Okay. But when it comes to concrete, earthwork and etcetera, well mechanical engineer perhaps do not want to dirty their hand with uh, earthwork, they want to dirty their hand with oils, whereas civil engineers do not want oil, they do not mind dabbling in earth and cement and concrete and things like that. Just to show that even after separation, branches of engineering contain a lot of overlap between them because these branches are to some extent arbitrary. If you look at it, the branching of science into physics, chemistry, even mathematics or now even chemistry and biology is to a large extent arbitrary. If you take physical chemistry, a chemist will call it physical chemistry, a physicist will call it chemical physics and if you go to the library you will find a very reputed journal called Journal of Physical Chemistry and another journal by the American Institute of Physics called Journal of Chemical Physics, JCP. So, JPC exists, JCP also exists. Okay. 
of course, they might have separated into series A, series B now. Now, after this, you know, mechanical engineers found that, well, they have, they are into too many things. So, from mechanical engineering, electrical engineering separated out. And of course, electrical engineering later separated into electrical and electronics and all that. Then, chemical engineering separated then metallurgical and materials separated out, then aerospace separated out. Okay. Of course, each one of them then separated. For example, chemical and metallurgical initially had a lot of overlap. Aerospace has a lot of overlap today with basic mechanical, electronics, CS and all that. What has happened is, in spite of uh, hiving out many of these disciplines, mechanical engineering never really switched itself off from many of these. So, that is why you will find in traditional mechanical engineering curriculum, there are many subjects and topics which sort of overlap with many one of these. Of course, this has been a digression. Let us come back to our scheme of things. In mechanical engineering, since we have machines which either produce power from natural resources or consume power for doing producing machines or doing something nice. Handling of power or energy is one of the major scheme in mechanical engineering. And if you look at the natural resources, the only long term natural resource which we have with us is the sun. Okay. You go back in history, I think all our energy seems to have come directly or indirectly because of the existence of the sun, the creation of the planetary system and all that. So, you can say solar energy is the primary energy, but because of uh, the history of earth, we have sort of stored storages of solar energy over very long term and these are known as fuels. Mainly the so called fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas and their variations are very long term concentrated storages of energy essentially from the sun and the sun earth system. And these fuels release their energy by default by a process of combustion. And this combustion is a process which takes place at a reasonably high temperature. And what they provide is what we call thermal energy, energy available at a reasonably high temperature. And the branch of engineering, mechanical engineering, which handles thermal energy is by default known as thermal engineering. So, thermal engineering is that part of mechanical engineering, which handles fuels, thermal energy for any purpose, maybe direct use or conversion into power. Now, it turns out that the basic thermal energy tends to be localized. You cannot distribute it, haul it over different long distances. You can haul fuels, but once you convert them into energy, it is difficult to haul that energy in the thermal form. And when it comes to utilization, we want energy in different forms. We want mechanical energy to run over pumps, cars, trains, etcetera. We want electrical energy for lighting and running other electrical devices. So, it is necessary for us to convert this into mechanical power or mechanical energy. And this conversion is at the heart of thermal engineering 
and the first thing we realize is that thermodynamics is that part of thermo thermal engineering which traditionally links such things as heat, work and temperature. To be formally defined yet, but if you look up history, these three words are something for which even a you know early teenager or a late uh, single digit ager, we do not have a name for it, preteen as a feel. People tend to work out. So, some effort is to be overcome for working out. So, the idea of work is there. The idea of heat, sun provides heat, fire provides heat, gas stove provides heat, electrical geyser provides heat. That idea of heat is also there. And because of fever and all that and running temperature, the idea of temperature is also there. So, these are only ideas. You ask them for definitions, they will tie themselves up in knots. But they will, oh, this is hot, high temperature. This provides some heat. And you have to really work out to open a jam door or lift a heavy package. So, those application fields are there, but there are no formal definitions which are appreciated or understood. In day to day life, there is no need for us to really appreciate the difference between heat, work and temperature or even what is energy. Many of us go through excellent contributions in life without ever worrying about this. Okay. But as mechanical engineers and particularly as teachers in mechanical engineering, we must understand very formally and unambiguously what these mean. And the study of thermodynamics essentially means understanding these and related concepts. If you look at a basic definition of thermodynamics, again you cannot define thermodynamics unless you use some terms which are within the scope of thermodynamics itself. Okay. For example, a very common definition is thermodynamics is a study of interaction of energy between systems. I think you will agree that such a definition or very similar definition will be found in any textbook and you might have used this definition. But remember that we are not developing something strictly mathematically or logically. So, when you provide this definition words like an interaction, energy, system are yet to be defined. So, to that extent we define thermodynamics without really telling them what exactly those details mean. If somebody asks you sir, what is uh, a system? You will say a system is a thermodynamic system. Wait a lecture or two and we will define it for you. What is an interaction? He said wait a few more lectures and we will define an interaction for you. So, and what is the proper definition of energy? That waits still few more lectures. When we come to first law, we will define it. So, if you look at it, this is some sort of a circular definition which we are using. Now, at this stage, there is nothing wrong in defining something as a circular definition because we want to compress a lot of ideas in one word. And without reference to any one of those ideas, one or more of those ideas, it will be impossible to give that compact definition. So, we will accept this circular definition, but later on our effort throughout would be to define terms like heat, work, temperature, energy and many other terms without falling into the trap of providing a circular definition. Okay. Uh, if you go to your library or talk to your colleague in computer science and engineering, there is a very famous person, 
his name is professor donald nuth nuth k n u t h i think he is east european polish or something but he had settled maybe he is born and settled in america elderly person known for the tech and latex uh, uh, document preparation schemes and also a very eminent person in basic computer science his his uh, yes yeah his uh, series of books called the art of computer programming are famous you go to the first volume i don't know i think searching and sorting or something is the title but i would like you to go to the library find out that uh, book and go to the index and look for circular definition and it will say c definition comma circular so you go to d from c and well there is an entry for definition and under that there are number of types of definitions direct indirect illustrative and circular in alphabetical order and you say definition comma circular it says c circular definition so is this a definition it's not a definition but is it useful yes it's very useful because it really makes you understand what a circular definition is in fact if you look at a circular definition it means a implies b and b implies a finally which one is true you don't know so this is a type of definition which makes you understand things without really defining what is circular definition with this thing you know what is circular definition but you can't define it unless give this to okay. so in thermodynamics i will ask yourself the question go to your traditional thermodynamics books see how heat is defined and see how temperature is defined fortunately or unfortunately both my daughter and son are mechanical engineers okay and when they were studying one of my very entertaining past time was to go through their standard prescribed books of course being a professor of mechanical engineering myself i had my favorite books also sort of imposed on them which they did not really resist but for me it was very entertaining to go through their books particularly those of thermodynamics and what i find is in many many of those books written specifically for their college their university their syllabus if you look at the definition of heat and you look at the definition of temperature you will find very innovative uses of circular definition heat was defined as a form of energy which can flow from a body at a higher temperature to a body at a lower temperature said okay so heat is defined in terms of temperature and temperature is also defined as there is something called a higher temperature and something called a lower temperature i think many of you would be familiar with this statement then somewhere either before or after that you come to the idea of temperature temperature is defined as a degree of hotness i think this word you all of you are familiar with right without defining what is hotness without defining what is degree of hotness okay and the degree of hotness is defined in such a way that heat energy can flow only from a higher temperature to a lower temperature so when you put these two together i said what are you doing if this is not a circular definition in a very convoluted way what it is it were mathematicians and physicists who uh, sort of straightened this out but we'll come to that slightly later so once having defined thermodynamics the next thing to do is to put it in the scheme of things for example since mechanical engineering is about machines we worry about 
handling of energy, we worry about the design of machines, we worry about manufacture of machines and we worry about the operation of machines. When it comes to handling of thermal engineering, the subjects which we will look at and this is what you should impress on students is thermodynamics, which is our absolute basic subject. And you tell them that in thermodynamics, we will be using typical working fluids like air and water, which we use not only for our day to day purposes, but also for significant engineering applications. And since these are the things which flow, the next thing we learn sometimes parallelly with this is fluid dynamics. Now, you tell them that although we define heat, temperature and energy and we talk of heat flow from one system to another, thermodynamics never tells us how to make that heat flow or at what rate that heat will flow if certain facilities are provided. Okay. Thermodynamics never talks about rate of heat transfer. As a derivative it may, but it is not the job of thermodynamics to say that the rate of heat transfer from the water here to the surrounding air, if the water is uh, warm, is so many watts. For that, we study a science and engineering which looks at the rate of heat transfer and it is known as science of heat transfer. And then you say that these are the three subjects which form the basis for thermal engineering. And after that, what comes are only applications. Applications to phenomena like combustion, applications to equipment like power plants or engine. applications to refrigerators and related stuff like in air conditioners, cryogenic equipment and all that and many other applications, sometimes just for fluid handling or sometimes just for uh, transferring heat in large scale from one place to another and so on. So, this is the scheme of thermal engineering and you should impress on the students that thermodynamics is at the base at the top of here, but you can always start from the bottom and show that like a tree all the things go. The main base is thermodynamics immediately followed by fluid mechanics heat transfer and then applications will be all branches of that tree. And of course, impress on them that the other branch of mechanical engineering where you worry about the design, detailed design of these machines and the other branch where you worry about what materials to use and how to produce those machines also have a similar things. For example, if you go to the machine design branch, design engineering, you start with equivalent of thermodynamics may be engineering mechanics there. Equivalent of fluid mechanics and heat transfer would be subject like solid mechanics, then kinetics and dynamics, then strength of materials, then followed by ap applied courses like design of various elements and various type of assemblies, sub assemblies and bigger machines. The next thing you should talk about is uh, the precursors and followers. By that we mean that, you know, I do not know here, before a student learns a course, he is supposed to have cleared what are known as prerequisite courses. That means, subjects which provide the required background for learning this given subject. So, what are the precursors of thermodynamics? Followers is something which we have seen, thermodynamics heat transfer. But which are the subjects or which are the topics one should learn, so that the learning of thermodynamics would be smooth? What is the background material? For example, we consider that arithmetic and to some extent geometry, basic geometry, elementary geometry 
is required for us to study and appreciate algebra. Algebra is required for us to study and appreciate calculus. Okay. Calculus is required to study and appreciate say differential equations and then partial differential equations and so on. So, there is a, a reasonably neat order in which you should study the subject matter. Okay. And even within a subject, we have this a reasonably neat order for studying the topic. So, similarly, if you say precursors, thermodynamics requires some tools and some background. For example, high school level physics and chemistry, where you know something about gases, liquids, some vague, maybe incorrect idea of what heat is, what energy is, what temperature is. At least these terminologies you should be comfortable with. So, one is high school physics and chemistry, then mathematics. Well, everything of high school level is ok, plus the way we are going to learn thermodynamics is some calculus, differential calculus mainly, also integral calculus particularly the calculus leading to what is known as exact differentials. This will be very useful in thermodynamics. And of course, since thermodynamics works with energy, any other branch of physics which handles energy in some form or the other, for example, we have electrical energy we have mechanical energy in springs. Some exposure to those will also be useful in thermodynamics. So, one should remember that thermodynamics, if you look at the physics point of view, is a proper branch of physics and has the same status as mechanism, mechanics, fluid mechanics, electricity, magnetism and what have you, gravitation, all that. Okay. So, thermodynamics does not partition itself off from other branches of physics, it lives with it in a proper happy fashion, like a happy family. So, a study of thermodynamics can really never be complete if you switch yourself off from other branches of physics. So, that is something you should impress on students. Now, what is thermodynamics about is, we have already said that thermodynamics will generally have our main scheme of thermodynamics will be something like this. We will not, we will we yet need to define this. We will have something called system A which could be any body like me or this bottle of water or this pen or this lamp whatever and a system B and thermodynamics will study interactions which will be energy interactions. And tell them that many of these terms are to be defined. So, tell them that this is only a trailer, all these terms will be defined in due course as we proceed. And then let us complete the first topic or first set of introductory topics by looking at contributors. Actually, uh, thermal engineering, if you go back in history, really started when human beings or our predecessors realized that the fiery phenomena, natural phenomena called fire was very dangerous, but also very useful. There must have been lots of accidents, maybe tribes must have been simply burned to ash by accidents. 
but then of course there were always uh, you know brave people curious people who tried uh, playing with fire as we say and slowly they realized that with proper care it is possible to control fire to create fire when we need it and douse it when we don't need it anymore so the perhaps the first contributors to thermodynamics were those who discovered the control of fire and you look at the earlier uh, philosophy uh, earth air fire water were supposed to be the four elements in the european scheme of things then we have those pancha mahabhutas prithvi aap tej vayu akash that tej is essentially which is uh, energy fire radiation which is at the central scheme of our uh, scientific philosophy so although this started and we started understanding that something is hot something is cold something is thermal energy there is something non thermal energy in a falling rock and some energy in the form of fluids flowing and wind blowing the perhaps the first person who formalized something about thermodynamics was carnot an engineer and a mechanical engineer to boot what we today say is the second law of thermodynamics was first proposed as a statement by carnot who looked at mining equipment essentially pumps and engines which pumped water out of mines and hauled material out of mines and he started thinking of course being an engineer you have to be good in economics also so he said look this much work i have to do this much water i have to pump out this much material i have to pull out and i have to burn wood coal to run my engines and of course if i can remove the same material from the same amount of water by burning less coal it's good for me less cash has to be spent so the idea of an efficiency of an engine was first put off put up in his head by carnot and he what a flight of fancy but he came up with the idea of reversibility in the idea of the maximum possible efficiency of an engine he had no idea of what heat meant he had no idea of what temperature meant but he said that look if i can make my engine reversible then i will be you know consuming the least amount of my fuel for producing the same amount of work that means hauling the same amount of material or pumping out the same amount of water after carnot there were many engineers for example what recently keenan who contributed to it but of course when some phenomena comes <coughs> physicists chemists and mathematicians start looking at it so if you can look at physicist then we have the count rumford benjamin rumford then we had joule chemist also you can put gibbs clausius kelvin physicist and physical chemist all these people have contributed to thermodynamics and of course no great physicist uh, you know ends his life without saying something or writing something about thermodynamics there were mathematicians who started looking at the proper structure of thermodynamics because engineers said look we have something to do with engines so long as we make our engines efficient we don't care about the laws of thermodynamics physicists want to understand but physicists never were happy with the structure of thermodynamics which they created because they knew that there were internal circular definitions internal inconsistencies in that it took mathematicians to straighten this out and the first person to straighten this out was a french mathematician physicist called carre theodore in fact his structure of thermodynamics is considered from the 
differential mathematics point of view, from the continuous behavior point of view, the most consistent structure of thermodynamics. Uh, of course, it is mathematically very involved. So, although we will be following his treatment when it comes to first law of thermodynamics, we will not be following his treatment when it comes to second law of thermodynamics, because we just do not have the appropriate mathematics background. The second law of thermodynamics, we will follow the uh, Keenan and uh, others formulation, Keenan Kelvin's formulation. After Kara Theodori, a few other mathematicians tried their hand, but uh, there was another mathematician, absolutely pure mathematician by the name Giles, R. Giles, I think, I do not know, Richard or Rudolf or something like that whose uh, mathematical foundations of thermodynamics, his work has been published in that form, is perhaps one of the excellent uh, ways of looking at thermodynamics, where you do not consider anything to be continuous. I mean, Kara Theodori assumes that uh, energy is not quantized, everything is continuous. You can work in terms of dE, dW, dQ, dT and all that. Everything is in terms of differentials. So, he brought in the idea of exact differentials and uh, when it comes to Giles, Giles only talks about states and changes of state from state 1 to state 2. He never brings in the idea that properties and interactions could be continuous. If they are continuous, so be it. So, his work is uh, on differential concepts, geometric concepts. Giles work is essentially based on topology. And since for some reason engineers are not exposed to topology and we do not really need topology, uh, we will just not look at Giles formulation at all. There are other people, for example, one name which I will write between engineers and physicists is Bridgman. P. W. Bijman, engineer physicist. So, in fact, it was his work which uh, led to a proper understanding of thermodynamics and we will be referring to his work as we proceed here. And these names we should know because these are the historically significant contributors to thermodynamics. Now, any questions on this before we come to basic ideas and definitions? The question from Professor Kulkarni is what is topology? Now, uh, topology is a branch of mathematics, considered pure mathematics, but has enough applications. That is a branch of mathematics where properties of only links and arrangement is considered. For example, if you take our normal geometry, if I take a straight line and bend it, it is a different line. But topologically, a straight line and a curved line are equivalent because you have a set of points arranged in a particular order. The direction does not matter. For example, if I take a sheet, if I bend it, it is geometrically different now. Instead of a flat one, it is curved or it is even closed. Okay. Topologically, so long as I do not close it, it is equivalent because the arrangement is the same. But if I close it, it is different because you are making a connection which did not exist earlier. So, topology considers situations where any sort of change of shape or size does not change the properties only a rearrangement changes the property. For example, whatever I do with this, so long as I do not reconnect it or tear it apart or punch a hole through it, topologically they are all equivalent. Applications of these are in thermodynamics, in uh, uh, cosmology and many other branches of physics. And topologically, for example, a, a ring of any kind is equivalent to any other ring. Okay. And topologically, if I take this out, this bottle is equivalent to a flat sheet, because what is a flat sheet? Something 
which has one single edge. And this is also something which has one single edge. There is no hole here, there is no hole here. And in principle, I can melt this and make it into a flat sheet without tearing a top or punching a hole. So, this is equivalent to this. So, our ring or a you know a typical South Indian medu vada provided it has a clear hole through it, they are equivalent. Okay. Or you take a, a solid piece and just drill a through hole through it, that is equivalent. So, what are the common properties of these? It is something which is looked at by topology seems very clear, but uh, there are good books which will make you understand topologically to the extent it is possible with us now. Okay. Any other question? Sir, uh, I have one point. Uh, even Galileo is considered as a basic contributor for the thermodynamics in the perspective of temperature. Which one? Temperature uh, oh. issue uh, that has been raised by Galileo hmm. and uh, later on has been confined to one particular definition. I think we can we can consider him as a contributor for the thermal See, my list of contributors yeah. is not exhaustive. Fine, fine. And okay. yes, actually, sir. the greatest contributors have been lost in history. Fine, fine. Those who really developed the basic idea. See, because that's what I said. We sort of we seem to have genetically inherited yes, from sir. our predecessors the idea of what is energy, what is hot, what is cold, yes, and sir. what is something temperature. Okay without really understanding it. But those who brought up those ideas in however vague a form, they have been lost to history. And of course, if you really start studying thermodynamics, I will have to give you maybe a hundred names of, there is a Kirkwood, then there is a Glaston and there are number of people who have contributed to thermodynamics. Okay. One question is, uh, what was the objective condition where uh, such a hypothetical assumption uh, Carnot has made? See, the greatness of people like yeah. Carnot or Joule lies in the fact that they did some experiment, however crude, but they could see through all those, you know, crudeness and approximations and uh, come up with some basic idea. For example, you look at Galileo, Newton's first law that a, in the absence of a force acting on it, a body will keep on moving in a straight line or in a state of rest for an indefinite time. So, long as a force does not come and left to itself, that will what will happen. Galileo worked with falling objects, Galileo worked with uh, you know balls and sliders moving on a surface. He tried to reduce the friction by using oil and smoother and smoother surface, but he never could and we know a zero friction surface is almost impossible to create. But he could see through all that and imagine and propose it as a first basic principle that if I have a frictionless surface, which today in his honor we call a frictionless surface, a Galilean surface, and we say if I push something, it will just keep on moving indefinitely till somebody else comes and does something with it. The greatness of those people lies in their being able to see through all those, you know, realities on earth and go to the heart of physics saying, if I idealize, this is what it will be. For example, Carnot's engine, the efficiency was nowhere near that of a reversible engine. None of his processes was anywhere near reversible. Even today's processes are not reversible. But his greatness lies in the fact that he could come up with the idea of a reversible process, which by which an engine could work either as an engine or as a, you know, refrigerator. He never had an idea of what a refrigerator was, but the idea of reversibility came up and then the idea that if I make everything reversible, I will spend the least amount of fuel for a given task. It is a great leap of imagination, but that is where the greatness of Carnot lies, Carnot and others like him lies. Okay. It is not a derivation like 1 plus 2 is 3, so 2 plus 1 must also be 3. It is not a logical derivation. It is inductive logic of the extreme kind. There is no proof. They said so. We found that in reality it is so. So, that is where it is. Sir, lies. as we have con considered the combustors as the control of fire, can't uh, we compare it with the control of energy and interaction with the system and surrounding? It is. We will finally put everything on one single setup where energies of all kind will be combined into one term. And we will say that look, 
um, there is nothing special about the way energy is defined in thermodynamics. There are other branches of physics which define that energy and will make use of those characteristics. Thank you.